Hello, and welcome to the Saturday matinee film discussion presented by the Denver Public Library. Today, we're going to be discussing Toby Hooper's legendary horror classic, 1974's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So a couple of housekeeping things first, please keep your mics muted during the discussion uh, to avoid any potential interruptions. Um, this discussion is being recorded, um, but for your privacy, only the hosts and the panelists videos will be captured. Uh, the recording will later be made available on YouTube in about three to four weeks. Um, around that time, you'll also be emailed a full list of all the films, books, poems, etc., that we discussed here today, and they'll be emailed to all the participants in about three to four weeks. So don't worry about taking notes. Uh, please use the chat to communicate with each other and to ask our panelists questions. Uh, we'll have a short Q&A towards the end of the discussion, uh, so get your questions into the chat as soon as possible, and we'll address as many as we can in the last 15 to 20 minutes or so. Uh, my name is Andrew with the Denver Public Library. My co-host today is Daria. Please message Daria or myself if you're having any technical issues and we'll try and get those taken care of for you. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome our guest here today, Mr. John Darneal. Uh, you may know him as a very talented singer and songwriter behind the Mountain Goats. He is also an author of several books, including the acclaimed novels, Wolf in White Van and Universal Harvester. Uh, leading our discussion today is our favorite film critic, Walter Chow. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Walter Chow and Mr. John Darniel. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I cannot contain my excitement today uh, to talk about one of my favorite movies of all time with one of my favorite people of all time. Uh, very briefly, I'll give a quick overview. Um, just the whole idea of horror, the whole idea of horror to me is near and dear and increasingly as i grow older i see horror as american or generally as folklore i think the best uh, fairy tales the best mythologies all have horror elements to them if you think about it uh you know even the bible really scary especially the old testament if you've read it there, there, there there's a sequel that's less but the original terrifying and so uh the idea of horror stories and the function that they serve in our culture is a, a fascinating one to me that i like to continue to unpack a thing that i say about horror films a lot and you've heard me say it a couple times already if you've joined before is that horror films for me are the indicator species in the cultural swamp they're like frogs and in, 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 in that they um demonstrate toxicity they demonstrate the things that are wrong in a culture and uh, sooner quicker than any other species uh horror movies tell us what's going on and so when you chase horror movies across the, the world and you, you can tell how a culture is doing by the quality i think and the intensity sometimes of their horror films uh the fact that we started remaking japanese horror films for instance after 9 11 speaks to me really soundly about how we have joined the Japanese after 9-11 and witnessing civilian populations uh, de destroyed by weapons of mass destruction, essentially. Uh, and so our horror movies became more nihilistic. They became less about, you know, daddy was a sailor or it's the devil and it became more, I don't know what happened. I don't know why it came out like this, but the world is a dark and bleak place. I think uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe spawns from the same sort of feeling of despair. Um, all joking aside, I, I, I do think that. Anyway, uh, this is directed by a guy named Toby Hooper. Uh, he made several movies, most famously Texas Chainsaw. You also may have seen Poltergeist, uh, a, a movie that a lot of people think Spielberg directed, but I maintain, you know, it's got a lot of Hooper elements to it. M moments in Poltergeist you're watching, and you're like, why is this in a PG rated movie? The face tearing off. It's that's Toby Hooper. Um, a, a good friend of mine refers to this. He, he, he works in the horror genre. He refers to it. His name is Lucky McKee. I'm just going to drop a name. He he says that uh, Te Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the Citizen Kane of, of horror movies. And for, for me, Toby Hooper is the Orson Welles of horror movies. Uh, he lost control of a lot of his work later on. I think he's been largely misunderstood. But this one, the one that he had complete control of from beginning to end, you know, really tiny budget, about $140,000. Uh, you know, non-professional actors, they, they got together, they, they shot in ridiculous conditions. They all went a little bit crazy during the shooting of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about the behind the scenes stuff here. Some of it horrifying, genuinely horrifying. Um, this one he had complete control over and he gathered with them, uh, you know, a genius level cinematographer who at that time was just a, you know, a film, film student recent film student named Daniel Pearl. He brought together a production designer named, named uh, Robert Burns. All of these guys are operating at a ridiculously 
almost unconscious level. And I want to talk a little bit with a, another great artist, John, today about, you know, how, how music sometimes just flows through you like a divine wind. And I think the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a representative of something that's a, of divine conception, if you will, or infernal, uh, if you will, there. Um, at, af, after Texas Ch Chainsaw came out, uh, that there was some, you know, quick condemnation in the press. And there's a really interesting article that's excerpted in Gunner's autobiography about the making of this film, a memoir called, Ch called Chainsaw Confidential, in which he recounts this um, review by Stephen Koch in uh, Harper's Magazine from November of 1976. Here's the first paragraph. The Texas, Chain Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a vile little piece of sick crap, which opened early in 1974 at a nameless Times Square exploitation house, there to be noticed only as another symptom of the wet rot, another step along the way. It is a particularly foul item in the currently developing hardcore pornography of murder, designed to milk a few more bucks out of the throng of shuffling wretches who still gather every other seat in those dank caverns for the scab picking of the human spirit, which have become so visible in the worst sections of the central cities. Fascinating article, not the least for which is he's talking about the same sort of paranoia, this urban paranoia that Texas Chainsaw is beginning now to unpack uh, in movies. It is a seminal film, not only just in the horror genre, but in American cinema. I, I think John will agree. When, when uh, he picked this movie, I almost did a, uh, a, a half flip backwards in, in, in joy. Um, rather than go on about this, because I could for another couple of hours just on my own, and no one's here for that. I want to introduce our guest today. Uh, you know, um, he was introduced to me by a mutual friend who gave me his book, this one, Wolf and White Van. And that's kind of what I knew about him. And so I read it. And I thought this novelist is ridiculously talented. This book, if you've not read it, is unbelievably great. It really is, guys. And, I, you know, if I didn't think so, I wouldn't mention it. I hope that we forgot about it. But it's it's, it's an American classic. It's great. Please read it. And I read it and I thought, who the hell is this guy? And so I did, did, did my research. And now I own proudly uh, every one of the Mountain Goats' albums. Uh, re reading his lyrics, he is a poet. Uh, I don't think he's going to like anything that I say about this as I go on. But I want to read a little bit of a, a song, you know, of, of, of his lyrics from a song called Absolute Lithops Effect. It goes, after one long season of waiting... I am breaking open. My insides are pink and raw, and it hurts me when I move my jaw, but I'm taking tiny steps forward. And I feel sure that my wounds will heal, and I will bloom here in my room with a little water and a little bit of sunlight and a little bit of tender mercy. Tender mercy. He has a song called uh, uh, This Year that I listen to as an anthem occasionally when things got really bleak for me, as it did for all of us during the pandemic. The, 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 the re refrain of that song is, I'm going to make it through this year if it kills me. And he sings it jubilantly and I, I took it you know to heart it's about other things but um in reading his books in reading even his 33 and a half that he wrote about black sabbath's master of reality in which he takes on the voice of a young man who's put put into a, you know a protective care essentially and hopes to get his journal back and talks about you know the, this album as, as a course of therapy in a way um this idea of artist therapy and the idea of reading the more I write of John Darnell's work, including his follow-up, Universal Harvester, which is also a masterpiece, um, the more I read about it, the more I felt like I knew the man. And I think the mark of all great art is that I come away from it knowing a lot about the person who did it. Um, his work is astounding. It's astounding. And what's more astounding for me is after meeting him a couple of times and hanging out a couple of times, he is absolutely humble about it. He's not precious about any of it. You wouldn't know sitting next to him that he is v john darneal so john <laughs> thanks for coming here talking about very, this movie with me today. very kind thank you thank you so much uh i was it's funny you were reading that it was a harper's review instead of of texas chainsaw yeah harper's uh, and like and the thing is so they're they're dismissing it uh, you know in these terms of like oh the worst of the Times square grindhouse I'm a person who never got to set foot inside a proper Times Square grindhouse before Walt Disney bought the entire block. And I'm wearing a retro Phantasma t-shirt. Jim Carl uh, programs a horror festival here in uh, North Carolina called Retro Phantasma. He used to program grindhouses in Times Square. Right? <laughs> and, and like, you know, if I could transport to go back in time, you know, you only get to pick one, 
it'd be hard not to go to the Times Square grindhouses and like be seeing snuff or whatever in an actual, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, every, so they're saying, oh, this is the worst. It's like, no, those are the reviews I read that drew me to this movie initially. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, that, 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 that's what John Waters would do. He would take reviews like this and use them as pull quotes for, for his posters and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and so, I mean, let, let, let's start with a big obvious question. Why did you choose the Texas Chainsaw Massacre today? So this is one of my favorite movies of all time. I was talking to you about uh, alongside The Wizard of Oz, uh, which was like my first favorite movie. But this was one that um, it, it was a perfect combination for me of when I first became intrigued by it, I couldn't see it, right? It only screened briefly at a drive-in near where I lived. It wasn't in the theaters and there wasn't a VHS yet, right? And then when I was, I was probably 19 or 20, I guess, that's when VHS was sort of enjoying a big flush and I saw it. I was like, well, this is pretty amazing. Although, and we'll talk about this, the the initial port to VHS, it wasn't a high quality transfer. It was like it was it was pretty bad. Um you really had to struggle to make out some stuff, you know. But but then I was um in college and I went to college late. I was 24 when I went to college, so I'd been out in the world a bit, and I was studying Greek tragedy, I was studying Roman literature. And, uh, and when you're studying something, you see everything through the lens of the thing you're studying, right? This is a common thing. And you can make that your whole career. You can say, well, look, I, I study, you know, Zen Buddhism, and here's my Zen Buddhist reading of whatever text, right? This is a way we can play. But when I was studying Greek tragedy and watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, to me, it was absolutely unmissable, right? That this is, th this satisfies most of my definitions of what makes a Greek tragedy, right? I mean, a tragedy is not something where where something bad happens to a person. A tragedy is something where something bad happens and it was inevitable and nobody could have stopped it, right? And we'll go a little deeper on that when we, when we get in because the way that tragedians have fun with this is to let you know all the ways they could have stopped it, but they can't know that. The characters, if they knew that, they wouldn't be in this story in the first place, right? So, so to me, that was super fascinating. Also, the fact that when I was a kid, Siskel and Ebert used to go in so hard on these kinds of movies. And I have like a really moralistic bent that's a natural part of me. So I would also go, oh, yeah, no, I don't think I like these. These guys hate them. They sound so terrible. But that's like, you know, anything that repulses you attracts you in equal measure, I think, you know. And so as soon as I got the chance to see one, I was like, okay, well, I'll go see this thing just to see how bad it is. And I, I didn't have like, you know, true gore hounds see it and they go, that's for me, all this blood. And I was like repulsed. I mean, a lot of them take place in a universe of moral rot, you know. Like if you see Last House on the Left, this is a foul movie. It really is, you know, an unpleasant place to spend your your day, you know, but and then there's something in that also. And I think now we live in an age where a lot of horror goes directly for that, like for, for you know, what's his name? Van Trier, right? Um, that's what they like, or, or, or the other guy, uh, Haneke, right? Uh, that's what they want, is for you to be all, feel very uncomfortable with moral with where you're situated. Most of the Grindhouse guys are actually just plain old moralists, right? It's like they really, they, they you know, a lot of the time it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's actually fairly Victorian, but this is not. This is not Victorian at all. This is Greek. And, uh, and I think it's a really complicated and rich text, and I could honestly go on about it all day. So yeah, that's why I, I picked well, it. You know, you know, I, I love that. I, I, you know, to your point, it opens in, in a time of plague, right? It, it, it opens when yeah. the whole world's falling down. The whole opening sort of, you, you hear from the van, the news going on. Yes. And yeah, the yeah. news report is an oil storage explosion has killed some workers. There's a cholera epidemic in San Francisco. A man yeah. has killed himself because there's well, a sporting event was blacked out. A 19-year-old girl has attacked a clerk for no reason. There's a collapse of a building in Atlanta killing 29 people. Yeah. There's an unidentified mutilated couple found in Gary, Indiana. There's a war starting in the Amazon over oil rights. There's a police in Dallas that found a child chained in the attic. There's a five-foot snowstorm in Colorado. We're opening like at the beginning of Oedipus Rex. The, the landscape is blasted there's a plague upon the, the land and then the first image that we really see in the film after the corpses in the, in the cemetery is the dead armadillo in the middle of the street this yeah. is our introduction to this freaking movie is a is a greek time of plague and destruction yeah. and yeah. this is america in 1973 right and, and he said you know uh, uh toby hooper and kim hankel the the uh, co-writer on this film it's inspired by you know the terrible stuff they saw in the news it's inspired by watergate it's inspired yeah. by vietnam you know, they're seeing the world, especially this lie of American civilization. Yeah, well, I think the hitchhiker, he wears, he's wearing a fatigues jacket in the full heat of the Texas sun, right? And I think that fatigues jacket is a little bit of a signal. Like maybe this guy went over. Maybe, 
maybe that's one of the things that some a, a young guy from Texas who works in slaughterhouses would have done is like go over to Vietnam and kill a bunch of people and come right back, you know, and uh, and be released out into the wild. <laughs> right. Well, well, and, and there, there's that element too of the slaughterhouse workers being put out of business by the yes. the, the me- mechanization of murder, yeah, yeah. of slaughter. He says it's, it's not as good. It's, <laughs> yeah. No, it's 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 but it's such a loaded text immediately from the first ten minutes or so. Right. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So talk to me more about the Greek elements, especially like in terms of the family and, and the kings and the, you know, the, the and Franklin in his chair. So you mentioned the family and that's a big part of it, too. Uh, the big part for me has been, you know, when you're studying Greek tragedy deep, you, you, it's one of those things where the first question, the first day of class is going to be what is a Greek tragedy? What defines it? Right? Because we know that once it gets to Rome, it's a very different thing. It becomes actually much more splatter thing, right? In Rome, and then later when tra- the Roman, Greek and Roman tragedies get revived in France in the 19th century with Grand Guignol, which is where splatter film comes from, right? With these theater with, uh, that would have just an overflow of blood, right? Like lots and lots of blood and murder on stage. It's very controversial, the Grand Guignol. And, um, but these were often their models with the Roman tragedies, which were really just like, the Greek ones minus a lot of, I mean, they were very good and I love them, but the Greek ones are philosophical texts, right? They're about our place in the world and how we relate to the gods who they all believe in, right? And uh, although whether uh, whether uh, Euripides believes in them is, is a question for me, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but Sophocles and Aeschylus certainly do. Um, but one of the things that happens reliably, and I'll, do, I'll contend this with any Greek tragedy, is that everybody involved the characters are getting signals and symbols constantly shown to them that tell them what's going to happen. And because they all share the same myths, they should be able to read these symbols and thereby evade their fate. However, in order to understand the symbols are being shown, they have to go through the thing that's going to kill them, right? So it's this paradox where if they could read the symbol, they'd run away from it. But to learn how to read it, you have to go to a school which will end your life, right? This happens in this movie several times before we get to the hitchhiker, but the hitchhiker makes it most explicit when he leaves the van and he writes a symbol on the side, right? We're going to see that symbol later when Leatherface comes through the door with the chainsaw to get in, right? And he carves the same symbol in the door, which they then reproduce in the Nike commercial. And I don't think they even know that they're doing it, right? But, uh, but there's this symbol. If you know what that symbol means, then you will know not to go anywhere near anything having anything to do with it. But to learn what that symbol means, you have to get close enough for its gods, right? For its for its kings and gods to do what they're going to do, which is kill you, right? And uh, and Sally survives, but whether Sally really survives is also another open question because the last we see of her, um, and I take the movie as a solo text. Any future movies I'm also interested in, but they don't. I don't believe in extended lore as far as movies goes. The movie exists on its own terms, right? So, um, so, but what she has to see, and this is also, this happens in, in Ajax by Sophocles and a bunch of others. If you do get through the machine and learn how to read the symbols, right? There's nothing left of the you who went in, right? The you who went in is, is altered so much that you're actually no longer mortal, right? You actually ascend or descend to the terrain of the gods that you met, right? So I think all this is actually, there's not a scene in this movie that doesn't play into that reading. Uh, but what I love about it is like, when I talk about this, that's all very intellectual and highfalutin and shit, you know, but the movie is not. The movie is just a fun and good movie, right? Uh, and and I think all these things are happening at a very, at a very, you know, put the story first level. And that's what makes horror movies great to me is like, they're, they're never, ever, ever going to put any of their, their important work uh, behind, you know, making these sorts of points. They trust the story to do the work itself. You know, even as you're talking, I'm thinking about Sally in the opening reading about the planets. She's obsessed with astrology, yeah. right? And she talks yeah. about Jupiter being, a, a, you know, a, a maleficent planet, you know, Jupiter, king Name of the gods, them. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it being in retrograde, you know, the dawning of the age of Aquarius is over. Now it's the age of Jupiter. Yeah. And this is what we see now for the rest of it. And of course, you know, Craven, last house on the left, he, he makes the, the hills have eyes and the whole clan is named after uh, Roman planets, yeah, like Jupiter, Pluto, yeah. And yeah, um, but yeah, there, there's something cosmic about the decay of this, and I love the images when they go to the grandfather's house, and oh, there's a, the nest of mites, and the, everything is falling down. Talk to me a little bit about the wet rot that the the guy from Harper's, you know, sort of decries. But I kind of love about this movie. It's like a it's like a Tennyson poem 
Almost. Oh yeah, no, it's it, it is very it's 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 showing you this house that again you can't really understand much about it, and and that scene where she gets into the room, that's where you get big tight views, and 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 what's funny is. You know, on the VHS I was talking about, you still you just squint to make them up. But in the restoration, it's all very clear. So you get all of these things that they're not just death; they're puzzles. They're things that that have been put together. They're built up, you know, the product of human labor, right? So this is a message from the film that that the people involved have a vocabulary, right? That isn't the one that we speak in, right? That isn't the one that the kids in the van speak in, right? And they have whether these are idle pieces of art. Or, or idols, icons, we, we don't know, we can't know, we don't see them in relation to them, but we know that they've populated this room with all this stuff, right? And it's, it's old bones and it's feathers and it's corpses, uh, it's, it's taxidermy, right? And, uh, and it, it's all built up and they do the same thing in, in the graveyard in the opening sequence where you've got, uh, you've got a, a corpse that's been flayed and then actually um, uh, 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 cause to be one with the the actual headstone right it's like like melded in this in this eerie way so this is a sign that like these people are not of this earth now they're not aliens there's no there's no actual reveal but they speak a different language like and by language i mean in every sense a different logic a different they're 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 a different class of being right um and uh and that's what I think that room is. And Sally is the one who sees it for what it is. It's like she's on the floor and she doesn't say anything because there's nothing you can say in human language in response to that, except to scream and hold your, your, your eyes wide open and say, it's time to get out of here. Which is the other thing I love about this movie is like, once it becomes time to get out, nobody gets a chance, right? Nobody gets even the, the ghost of a chance, right? It's a lot of these movies draw it out and they, they make you sort of, uh, uh, you know, it becomes the Friday the 13th movies, which I also like, you know, but, but they're also oh, is, is, is she going to get it now? Is she going to, is she going to get killed yet? Is she going to get killed yet? You wait and the climax and also Giallo are like this, right? The, the Italian predecessors, the slasher movies, you know, are about building you to a, a sort of a sexual climax of murder, right? This is not that at all, right? This is not related to the Gialli in any way. The second there's an opportunity for a murder, it happens instantly. Right. And the person is dead within seconds. <laughs> it's like there's no there's no none of the sadism that comes to define this genre. Yeah, no, I, I, I really like the idea that it's not a series of bad decisions that these kids are making. They have made one bad decision, one, kind one. of, That's right. you know, and there, yeah, there, yeah. there there's a reason for it. Even there, he, he's looking for gas. He found a generator. Yeah. OK, these guys must have gas. Anybody home? Hello. He sh probably shouldn't have gone in. He definitely shouldn't have. And then he gets sledgehammered and then everyone else gets sledgehammered and it's bam, bam, bam. Well, but, and how, uh, does, how does the, the, the father know uh, to send them to his house? Because the symbol is on the side of the van. He sees it and he slaps the van and he, and he says, you'll be just fine. <laughs> it's like <laughs> and there's, there's a level of communication going on amongst the family that that no one in, no one else on the screen is able to understand. We should talk about the production design by Robert Burns. It is uh, works of genius. These little, you know, constructs and things that he's put together. And there's all, you know, there's a whole business around it now. You know, you, you see these oddity stores that put together these dioramas and these things with, you know, animal parts and everything. But he's doing this for this movie, and it creates such an unbelievable atmosphere of, of you know, and, and they're 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 shooting in like 120 degree temperatures sometimes. Yeah. So it was all really. Summer. Yeah. It was really smelly, I guess, you know, on set after a while. But talk to me a little bit about art. You know, there, there's a scene where that with a nail driven through the uh, a clock face. Yes. Which is oh, amazing. Unbelievable. Right. It was so dolly. Right. <laughs> talk to me as an artist, if you can, about wh what that means that these the family, they're, they're artists. So this is really interesting because my editor at FSG uh, was the guy who gave me the reading on Universal Harvester that uh, uh that Sarah Jane is an artist, right? That's what she's doing. She's a director, right? She's directing these films to work through her trauma, right? Um, and, uh, but, uh, or not, not Sarah Jane, Lisa Sample. Um, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I heard, I was like, I don't want to think I'm just writing about writers, you know? But most writers are doing that whether they want to accept it or not. <laughs> it's like, because you can only really know yourself and so you're writing about yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what's the role of 
you know, art in this movie. These guys are artists. The, these so they are, and they're they're they actually they make sausage, right? Which is <laughs> one thing that is amazing is like sausage is one of those meats, and I don't eat meat, but but it is the the meat that's an art. I mean, you can make cases for for fillets or whatever, but any, anybody could do that. But to make a good sausage, you know, the spice profile. It's like anything that involves a spice profile. That's an artisanal process, right? That's like you know, bad sausage is terrible and boring, and good sausage you never forget eating it, right? And uh, and it's true, right? Uh, and and that's one sign that they're artists. I should also say, and this is, I, I think people know this, but it's an Easter egg for Mountain Goats people. The, the, the cover of my first full length CD is an explicit reference to that, right? To all these things where I, I hung a bunch of plastic uh, cheap toys in a palm tree. And then I held the palm tree up against the sky and had my friend Marcella, who was a filmmaker, take a picture of it, right? So you have all these toys hanging from a palm tree and wondering why they're there you know and so uh which i mean that's the thing is they again they're advertising who they are right they are advertising things about themselves in a in a terminology that is inscrutable to the outside right uh which is kind of a neat trick right and i think actually most um countercultural any any community that has to live beneath the surface of a dominant culture right does the same sort of game, right? Has 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 lingo and has has a, a sort of a language of gesture and a, an economy of gesture, where you're able to communicate in this language inside the subculture in a way that the broader culture can't read it, right? And that's one of the things you get to keep for yourself, right? Uh, and in this family, who obviously is aberrant, and they're terrible people. I'm not saying like we're supposed to be in the, you know, but but that's one thing they get is that they have, you know, one one of the the pluses for them of being the way they are is that other people aren't going to be able to stop them because they won't see who they are. They're, you know, I always wonder how they got the house. That's what it's like, where, whose, whose house is that? <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about this idea about d dominant and subordinate cultures, because this film is really addressing an economic cast. Uh, uh, you know, the, it, it, if there's a plague that's happening in this world, it, it's an industrial plague. It's like, you know, we're, it's like deliverance. Who are the, really the bad guys in Deliverance? Is it the the vacationing yuppies who you know because they need to, need more energy for their electricity, they're going to flood the entire valley, right? Yeah, yeah. Or is it or is it the hill people who are sort of just you know kind of protecting their, their way of life? This if idea you just of, out of the hills, none of this would have happened. <laughs> uh, exactly right. Well, and and they, but they started it. They're the ones who wanted to dam the freaking river, right? Yeah. And so here, the the it's not clear why the kids are out here. It's not clear whatever, but they have transgressed the, no, the, no. the festivities don't really begin until they transgress into That's this right. place so this paranoia about hey i i would drive to you john but i don't want to get stuck in the backwoods of colorado much less the backwoods of north carolina the paranoia <laughs> begins kind of with this stuff here this mythology this folklore where you know those people in the valley over there they're cannibals it, no. there's a very primal anthropological feeling about texas chainsaw you know, yeah. talk to me more about that, about this idea of dominant cultures and this idea of economic ruin and, and the caste system that yeah. casting people's monsters. No, there is that. I mean, that's like such a we talked about that. that you, talk, you mentioned exploitation in, a, in a, a, a text last night that, that you know, there's always that, oh, these these people. You know, and in Texas, they totally people from Austin will 100 percent talk about people from from outside of Austin is like, well, that's that's you know, this is really not there's there's at least two Texases. Right. And most people in Texas feel that way. And if you get it's the same anywhere where you have rural anything. Um, I don't think just in America, I think everywhere is like the, the rural people tend to get this rep of being backwards. Uh, and this is the tyranny of the city, which is a hard question for me, because I think in a world as overpopulated as ours, we should be living closer together. Right. I think the urbanists are right that, you know, that to have a gigantic backyard and everything is kind of, it's not sustainable, you know, but at the, at the same time, when you tell people who have lived for generations and generations before industrialization, well, now you have to live close to people, right? Now you, now you, you got to learn to get along with people. It's like, well, I come from, I come from people who our whole deal is we don't get along with people. You know, we make sausage for you, you come and get it. We don't have to hang out with you, you know? And, uh, and I think that's a big part of it is that the, the rural culture and, and, and this is what we mean by rural culture and when it starts vanishing. When we talk about the Greeks, you read Hesiod, 5th century BC, he's already complaining that the old ways are vanishing and we don't live like we used to. That's one of the oldest tricks in the book is to say, oh, yeah, no, we don't live like we used to. And we used to live wise. And now all these new people are building these big cities and they suck. You know, people have been saying that forever, right? For literally forever. Um, but it remains a very, very uh, a vibrant trope for 
for, for looking at things, because we think that way too. We do, we do tend to think that the hill people, the rural people, hicks, we have a whole language of how to dismiss these people, right? Um, and we call them Trump voters now, right? Oh. It's like, that's, that's what we call them. And, uh, and, and, and insisting on, on casting them that way actually has given us a boogeyman instead of facing that, you know, I, I, I jog, I live in a very enlightened town in North Carolina and I've several times jogged past a house with a big old Trump Pence flag still handy, hanging in the yard in April of 2020, right? Those, those people are not out in the hills. They're among us. Hill people are a, are, are, are a figment. <laughs> it's like, like uh, because we don't really understand the, the hills. But, but, uh, but there is that. We don't know where they're from. We don't know where these kids are going, right? But I also love about this movie that, um, that the kids are not that pleasant, right? They're not, they're not great. We have somebody who's going on about astrology and it's, you know, nobody in the van is that into it, you know, and she's insisting on it. And that's very much a seventies trope is the person who's going to insist on reading your horoscope, even if like, who gives a shit? It's 120 <laughs> degrees in here. I don't really need to hear about how Venus is in retrograde, you know? Um, and Franklin, one of the boldest characters ever written, because usually if you are writing a character who's disabled, you make him a sympathetic character, right? That's an easy way to go, right? This poor fellow, you know, he's a little overweight and he's in a wheelchair. We don't know why he's at the mercy of his family. He can't take care of himself, you know? Um, and they visibly are a little put out by having him along, you know? And so you normally, you direct and write that character to be somebody who I feel a little sympathy for. And they just let you feel how pissed he is at everything, right? They really show you how he feels instead of making him an object of pity or anything. It's like, no, Franklin is angry and he's unpleasant to be around, right? He's like, yeah. and I thought that was, super, and then to kill him anyway. Right? It's like, it's the most amazing thing that, that Hooper does. He's like, he, he makes a whole commentary on how we present disability on film briefly. Like the most filmmakers would be terrified to present a guy like Franklin, you know, not, and not just today forever. It's like in 1974, people were so, why are you giving me the disabled character and making him un unpleasant when, when there's no visibility for, for people in wheelchairs. And I think Toby Hooper would say, because it is condescending to give, anybody from just uh, an underrepresented uh, demographic visibility and then make them an angel, right? It's like, that's, that's really condescending, you know? And, uh, and I think it's an incredible thing that they do is like make all these victims, none of them are particularly pleasant, right? But the one who you would at least expect to be pleasant is actually a guy who you just can't stand to be around. It's come up a couple of times in what you've been talking about, but there, there used to be an alien element to this. Um, yeah. You know, in the original screenplay, it, the bad guy was a glowing ball of energy. <laughs> that was kind of kind of like sucking up all the bad bad mojo of the world, right? And kind of reflecting it out this way. And and Hooper came up with this idea of you know just a, a guy with a chainsaw because he was stuck at a hardware store during like a Black Friday or something like that. It was a crush of people, and he couldn't get out, and he started to panic, and he saw like a you know the the chainsaw display, and he thought you know what. If I had, if I just fired one of those guys up, I could get out of here really quickly. And so that's I kind love of that where so much because that is so. I love anything that's about like I had this big idea and it was going to cost a bunch of money and it wasn't going to look good in my independent film anyway. And then I thought, what if a chainsaw? <laughs> it's just so good. <laughs> Indeed. And and you know the the actor who played Franklin, everybody actually did hate him on on, on yeah. you know during the shooting of it. Sally hate you, you know uh, uh, she hated him and and uh, and, and good. Gunnar Hansen writes in this great book. You really should read this book. It's amazing if you've not read it. Um, everybody else, I'm sure you've read it, John. But um, that 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 when he was killing him on the uh, you know in the wheelchair in the middle of the night sequence, he he wanted to actually kill him. It, he's like it was that was the funnest night of the whole shoot. And part of the way that they had you know that there's the most blood in that scene. There's not very much of it in this movie. They were hoping for a PG rating, <laughs> which, you know, I don't think you can ever get a PG rating, no matter how much you cut out of this movie, but um, they, 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 they had the, uh, screen, the screenwriter, uh, I mean, the DP's wife, uh, um, Dottie Pearl and Toby Hooper. And uh, I think Daniel Pearl as well, the, the uh, DP, they all had mouthfuls of this uh, Cairo syrup blood and they're spitting it at him as he was, as, 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 he, as, as, he's, as he's dying that's incredible <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah i mean a, a lot of the animus that you see in this movie a lot of the anxiety a lot of the fear and, and all of that stuff kind of was happening too organically as we were you know as these guys were put through the ringer working 16 hours a day seven days a week unbelievably bad situations you know there, there's a scene where sally's finger gets cut gunner yeah. hansen admits that he actually cut the finger because they couldn't get the prop knife to work 
and just he's like, we can't, I can't, can't keep doing this. And he cut, he cuts her finger. And so th- there's madness, and yeah. it's like Apocalypse Now. There's a madness yeah. about this film, and you know, like halfway through shooting Apocalypse Now, Francis Coppola says, "We're not shooting a movie about Vietnam. This is Vietnam. <laughs> this, this is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that we're watching unfold. It's, um, it's madness that's captured." There screen. is so much in there because like like we're in a time and it's a good time to be in when artists who behave monstrously and claim to be doing so in the service of their art, like directors, and Tarantino comes under, you know, comes under a lot of fire for not caring about the health of his um, of, of his uh, actors. You know, for, there's that scene with the, the car crash. Right. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, sort of the most legendary uh, version of this is John Landis. Right. That, you know, and that, that's the, the horrifying uh, extremity of it. But, you know, and, and I don't want to, it's just, it's, it's, it's not an either or issue here. You should be cool to people. You should be kind to people. You don't have to be cruel to people to get a good performance out of them. But there is something to be said for the notion that if we all suffer while we're going through making something, then the thing we're making is going to get a little more of us, right? It's going to get some of our suffering. And if we're artists, one thing you get good at is, is, doing a lead into gold trick with that finding your suffering and making something cool out of it that's part of why you like doing it right it's like oh i had some shitty experiences but i made this song out of it that i really like you know and if other people like it then it becomes even more powerful right and so i mean i think there is no question that the circumstances in which this film was made were terrible for everybody involved and contributed strongly to it being a great film it's like I don't think you can make this movie if anybody has a trailer that they want to go to. Like I no. think you have to have people who desperately want to be done, right? And who at some point go, oh, we're just never going to finish. We're just, you know what? This is what I do now because I've experienced this on tour. If you're on a shitty tour, I've been on tours. There's a show of mine, um, from the bottom of the hill in San Francisco in I want to say 2009, right? These were the worst days of my entire life. My, my physical health had collapsed and with it, my mental health. And I, I mean, I was in a state that I call crying while awake. And it was just the case It's like, we would park the van somewhere, we would go in to get breakfast and I would just sit in the van and cry. I could not function. I needed to go home. I needed to stop touring. I needed to go get a therapist. I didn't have any of this. I just had the next date and an in-store and people coming up to talk to me. And then if I wasn't friendly, looking at me like I was an asshole, it's like, I want to die. I want to die every minute of my day right now. But that show is a killer show. And I, and you can't tell I made jokes. I laughed. I did my fucking job. Right. And, uh, and I think that's the case with this movie. It's like, it's 120 degrees. It's Texas. There's no money, right? There's just this movie we have to make. And I think all of that really comes to a boil in the performances and the direction and everything. Absolutely. I, and especially with Marilyn Burns, it's one of the great performances Oh my God. Without qualification, she's unbelievable in this movie. It Just could be a silent film performance. This would have been a great performance under Abel Gantz, right? It's like <laughs> it, you, you could take the sound away and it's still great. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, yeah. I, and, and it's genuinely unsettling. And I think that genuineness of that unsettlement is that we know, at least now everyone does, that it was kind of real in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. There's a scene where she's running through the forest and her hair gets caught. On, on on you know on some of the mesquite out there and she's kind of pulling it out and Han- and hanson's like well i was gonna catch right up to her so i just started trimming a tree or whatever you kind of see it in the movie it's weird you yeah. stop chasing her to wait for her to untangle and then she entangles and runs but later marilyn burns was like i thought you were actually going to kill me you can't <laughs> he couldn't see out of the mask so she thought that he was going to just run into the back of her with a Man. chainsaw so that horror in that moment yeah, was her thinking actually that it was going to happen? They dropped her out of windows. They, they would like hang down and yeah. hold on to her, so she was like eight feet off the ground instead of fourteen feet off the ground. And then they drop her and they film her, you know, landing. It was you could never do this again. You should never have done it the first time. They just That's right, but here it is, and the <laughs> the, the artifact that they created is indelible. It, it, it's like the Wizard of Oz in a lot of ways. You know, I like that you like both of those movies because the, the, the they're both immaculate conceptions. I don't know who the father of this stuff is. I don't know who the mother of the stuff is. The result of it is this c- collaboration of mir- miraculous events. And it created this thing. Yeah. No, it is what is one of those things that if you make art, one of the things you should learn from both of those movies is to learn to let go, you know, and let the thing be what it's going to be. Like right? with Withers of Oz, they wanted Shirley Temple to play 
uh, to play Dorothy. Well, that would have been a catastrophic billing. We wouldn't be talking about this movie today. Right. Exactly. Um, and there's so many things in that movie that are so messed up. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I think at some point everybody goes, okay, you know what? This movie is, this isn't going to be good. Let's, let's make our movie that we're making and move on with our lives. And if that's what you do, you're just going focusing on the work and, 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 and staying out of the results. It's one of those lines, you know, it's like, you know, I, I think in this, there's no way anybody is thinking about the afterlife of the movie at all when they're making this film. Nobody's thinking about what it's going to do for their reputation or whether it's going to make money or whether they're going to be able to make back. I, I don't think any of that is anywhere near their heads. You know, now it's a luxury to think about art in that way, you know, but, but, uh, but, but I think it's pretty clear. It's like they've, they've attained that state where it's, you know, it's sort of, it's almost adversarial. It's you versus the text you're trying to produce. And only one of us is going to survive it. And it's going to be me. <laughs> so. Indeed. Uh, th th there's so many, so much lore and we can go on forever about the lore, but I really just recommend you, you know, picking up maybe the digital version of, uh, of, of Gunner's thing. A couple of other quick recommendations of books to read men, women and chainsaws by Carol Clover, <laughs> just a foundational text. Carol Clover, you know, to, to, to our conversation, she's actually a professor of Norse mythology and Norse literature at, at UC Berkeley. I think she's retired at this point, but you know, this in how brutal is North mythology for her to be attracted to this genre to, you know, Texas Chainsaw, which I would argue is not really a slasher film. You know, we can get real nerdy about that, but you know, the slasher genre and for her to talk about this in terms of gender, you know, we should maybe talk really quickly before we get some questions about gender in Texas Chainsaw. It's, it's an all male, society and the the uh, dinner sequence leatherface put, puts on a woman's face for it and an apron and she and you know he sort of acts in the role of, of a mother talk to me a little bit about you know um gender if you have any thoughts about that in texas so Chain, it's yeah. super interesting in this movie because again we have i mean later um not much later in italy it's concurrent but we're not nobody over here has seen those movies yet um uh but, but you have the final girl right and, and sally is one but she's not your usual final girl. I mean, the final girl generally survives often through some something, some cleverness on her part or, or some accident on the killer's part. And usually it's something with something much more focused. You have a, a slasher who's, who's chasing her. Leatherface is chasing Sally, but it's not about Sally at all. <laughs> it's like she's just, you know, she's an animal to him. Right. Um, she's that that's what he does. He, he, he carves up animals. Um, and there's there is a hint that they use the bodies for barbecue. I love that it's just left as a hint. But there's barbecue for sale at the uh, at the station and there's a at the gas station. And there's a, a moment of the camera dwelling on some sausages and stuff hanging in uh, in there. And I think there's a hint that those are actually from human bodies. Right. Um, but uh, but it's not something to be explored. Um, uh, but with with gender, I mean, it, it's very, you know, nobody in the in the in the van seems to be dating, which is pretty refreshing, right? Um, if you go see The Hills Have Eyes, uh, there's dates involved, right? There's 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 love triangles, and that's just sort of nicely excluded. It is lovely, and it's one thing that I think that a lot of us who like horror like is like a lot of really trashy horror movies just dispense with all that. It's like no, there's no romantic relationships here. We're here to carve up bodies and get out, you know. It's so, um, but also Sally. Um, uh, she doesn't survive by her wit. She doesn't have to bring something special. It's her terror that saves her. It's that that she is terrified, right? And and that she's been terrified since she got there. And she's not foolish and she's not trying to explore anything. And she doesn't want to know. She's not trying to engage with these alphabets and, and languages that don't belong to her. She instantly recognizes, I don't belong here, right? This is not my place, right? I... We all need to get out, right? Everybody else is kind of curious. Franklin especially is like, well, isn't that something? He keeps asking questions like, you know, when the hitchhiker cuts his finger, he's trying to tell them, I'm not like you, right? This is what I do to entertain myself. And Franklin, you think you can do that? I don't think I could do that. It still, it takes something, right? Sally's not buying any of that. Right? And so uh, so she, she, she has a, a sort of a rational um, uh, sort of, maternal quality in that, that she's not engaging this at an emotional level. Her terror is not that she's afraid of them as people. She's afraid for her life, right? Which I think is, is, uh, is, is one of the things that horror does a lot with gender is, is, is to say, look, the reason I'm afraid of you is not, not that, not, nothing to do with you. It's that existentially you are a threat to me. Right. And, uh, and so, 
but 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 the moment what it takes for her to get away from this is the you know the cost of her mind that that amazing last scene as soon as they make the highway right um and she's gone she's she's laughing and screaming right and when you see her when 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 the truck hits leatherface in one of the greatest moments in the history of cinema that he's they that uh, that he's standing there waving though he doesn't hit him when the, when the truck hits the hitchhiker right and she sees it and she laughs and laughs and Leatherface is dancing around with a chainsaw above his head in an absolute orgy of a, a, a one man orgy of, 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 uh, of ecstasy, right? He's in this ecstasy of, of being who he is. And she is a mirror of that because having emerged from this, she can't be who she was. And she's just laughing and screaming. And it's not just relief. I think it's very clear. She's covered in blood. She's covered in blood and sweat. Uh, and uh, and and laughing with this plastered, very uh, silent film uh, expression on her face, uh, and it, it's real plain that she's been transformed, right? Uh, and has had to be transformed, right? Uh, and I think that that talks about about surviving trauma, which I think is like something we can't talk about with engaging. Like that, there's there's there is a a gender presentation in our society that, that, that is the one that gets to inherit the trauma, right? That that is the 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 uh, you know, the, the identified patient of trauma, right? And that's women, right? So, uh, so yeah, I don't know I'm qualified to talk at any further length about that, but that's my, my, my initial look. Well, you know, I, I, I felt like, you know, to sort of shift gears a, a tiny bit that I felt like Sally in the back of the pickup truck on election night, um, this, this <laughs> last time. you know, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm super not okay. Obviously. Uh, I, 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 something terrible has happened to me, obviously. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm a shell of who I used to be, but now I know things about other people that I didn't know before. Yeah. After this ordeal, it, it's you know, wa- wa- watching Texas Chainsaw now, and this is the first time I watched it since you know the the Biden administration. I felt it, I felt differently all mm. of a sudden. I yeah. felt like a, a more closer, a deeper empathy. I don't want to overstate it, but I, I I understood the horror in a different way. Like yeah. Oh my God, I get this. You know, in, in a way that I got it before, but. You know, to your point, more from a visceral kind of, you know, I, I every time I watch this movie, it's the same level of chaos, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I always got that. And I love that about it. It's a really, truly dangerous film. But after ne- now, I can look at it sort of like, oh, I get it. This is about trauma and this is about what we've been through. Yeah. And it's always eternal because of that. Yeah, no, that's right. It's not about our trauma specifically, but it is about surviving something, right? And that one thing in it that's so insightful for that, if you've ever been through some shit, it doesn't have to be like the most traumatic abuse scenario. It's like just just stuff that you needed to get through a, a period of your life that was bad, right? That's the time when the chainsaw sound starts and it never stops for the last yeah. 10 minutes of the movie, right? You're hearing this noise and it never, it's that and the screams and it's that and the screams, right? And that is it, right? <laughs> it's so incredible because it, it takes you there, right? It really, the sound design, which has been work doing a lot of work throughout the movie, there's all these grind noises, these, uh, it's so different from what becomes the horror theme trope, which becomes like patterning it after zombies soundtracks for, for the Gialli, which are great too. But, but this is really like regards sound as a way of, of doing something almost, you know, of sneaking it past you. Right. Cause you know, there's going to be sound on screen. You know, the things that they bring in are going to produce sound. Right. So once the sounds are screaming at a chainsaw, it's this symphonic sort of, it's a very, um, Oh, what's that guy as composer? I can't. Threnody for the insect victims of Hiroshima. I can't. Oh, uh, uh, Gretzky. Uh, no, oh, no, it's not. Uh, 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 what, okay. is his, what is his name? Um, but uh, but but it does have this um, uh, this quality of 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 being a third player, being a chorus on screen, right? Um, that uh, that you're having these these sounds that are explaining it to you. Um. You know, in a in a non 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 linguistic way, it's a, it's Penderecki is who it is. Yeah, it's the Polish guy, Christoph. Uh, is he Polish? I don't know. Yes. Yeah, no, it, 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 Polish or Czech? I forget. It's yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to talk a little bit more if we can about the sound the the, the sound design. It's a it's a stand it's a it's a stand up bass that they torture. You know. Oh, is that it's, right? It's, oh, yeah. That's so cool. Wayne Bell won't 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 is that his name? He won't share how he makes the the photograph noise. You know that opens it and stuff. But oh, yeah. I love the I love the idea of documentation of photographing too. There's something about storytelling embedded in all of this. Uh, totally, yeah. All of this. Anyway, it's so quite- rich. That's the thing about this movie is how do they every scene every time you watch it. I mean, this is true with any movie you really engage with deeply. That every time you watch it, there's a little more to say, you know. But 
But with this, it really is like every scene is like is playing into whichever reading you're giving it. It all fits together so well. It's such a coherent text, you know. Yeah. Well, it's because it's a product of the unconscious. You, you yeah. don't have to plan this out. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, it's just great. It's, it's an archetype. All right. Uh, questions that for 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 John about Texas Chainsaw. Uh, maybe a quick question about the sound, uh, since we're talking about that. Anna asked, do you know if they filmed Leatherface running around with the chainsaw? Was it on? Uh, did they add the sound later? Yes, the chainsaw was actually all of it. None, none of it was done in post production. All of it was done uh, in the moment. There, there was some post work, but not for the chainsaw noises. And sometimes the, the 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 chain had teeth on it. Sometimes it didn't. Sometimes they pulled the clutch out of it so that it wasn't spinning, but it was still yeah. making a sort of noise. Um, the the scene where uh, Kirk, uh, the uh, girlfriend of uh, of Pam's, who who, who gets it second. Um, Pam gets a second. Kirk gets a first. He's lying on the yeah. table, and Pam is uh, is hung up on the uh, on the meat hook <laughs> indelibly. Um, he's bringing the yeah. chainsaw down, and Toby Hooper was like, "You know what? The pitch of the saw needs to change. So b- the, when it cuts into Kirk's face, so what you need to do is you need to like bring it down like three inches from his head on the table, so that you're cutting the table, and then it'll change the pitch of it. But don't cut Kirk, right? So." They so did that. Awkward. It's ridiculous because it's so dangerous. If you've ever used a chainsaw, chainsaws skip and they jump and whatever. And if he caught a knot in the table next to this actor's head, Kirk, uh, you know, played by William Vale, if he caught a knot or something in it, it would have jumped up and it would have killed William Vale. It, it yeah. would have killed him. And <laughs> they did stuff like this throughout the whole thing. At the end, when the chainsaw cuts his leg, do you know the yeah. story, John, how, how, how they did that? I it, forget all the stories that aren't in the movie themselves. <laughs> <laughs> he... Well, they they strapped a piece of sheet metal. They formed it around his leg, and then they put a stake on top of it, and then they put a, a blood bag on top of that, so that the chainsaw would actually cut, cut through the stake, cut through the blood bag, and then hit the the uh, the the uh, metal the steel. The metal would not not hurt him because they're scientists yeah. and they know this, right? Wait. So they, they, <laughs> they tried it the first time, and they had it with a chain that didn't have teeth on it and didn't cut, and and, and Hanson's like. F this. I'm lying on asphalt. It's like 200 degrees. I have to throw myself down without any pillows or anything because you have to shoot me falling down. So I'm actually falling. I'm just put the blades on it. So they put the blades on it and he cuts himself through, you know, he, he cuts the stake. He cuts the blood back. Yeah. And then he feels this like sharp pain. And so he drops this and he grabs it. And he, as he's grabbing it, you know, the blood is squirting out of his hands from the blood bag and everything. And he's sure that he's cut his leg. They looked at it. What it's done is that the chainsaw has heated up the metal so quickly yeah. in that spot that it actually burned his leg. So he had a yeah. burn spot on his leg, and he, but he thought he'd cut himself. So that moment when he's like recoiling, grabbing his leg and the blood, that's also genuine. It's real. <laughs> it's real, man. It's like a uh, medium cool, that, 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 that film where, you know, at some point, you know, the, the, the Haskell Wexler film where he's shooting at the, you know, the, the 1968 Democratic Convention, you can hear somebody in the film say, watch out, Haskell, it's real. Yeah. Like you, you have the sort of like, you know, and, 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 you know, and, 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 and Gunnar Hansen re- recalls at the end when he's doing the dance of ecstasy that he was so angry and over it that he was actually swinging it towards Toby Hooper on purpose Amazing. just to watch him scatter. The dance so, is one of the greatest moments in cinema. I mean, I just when I see it, it's so because it, it reaches this totally non-linguistic point that we've been at for 10 minutes or so, but now it's just the sound of the chainsaw and, and, you know, you can hear wind where there's no wind. It's just one of the most beautiful. And that's, what's amazing about this movie is like, it, you know, if you'd have used the word beautiful to describe it when it came out, you, they would have fired you from your job as film critic, right? but it, it is beautiful. <laughs> it is absolutely beautiful. The, 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 the really famous tracking shot underneath the swing when Pam gets up and walks towards the, the yeah. house you know um, um daniel pearl the dp on this he was on the set of, ni- of 1941 the spielberg film because his wife dotty w- was doing work for spielberg and spielberg you know was is, is, is he's introduced to pearl and pearls you know hey you know whatever i'm daniel pearl and, and spielberg was like you shot texas chainsaw massacre right and he's like yeah and spielberg took him aside and said talk to me about the tracking shot underneath the swing and so <laughs> that that's this movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The Steven Spielberg, and a, vi- a visual savant, wanted yeah. to know how the, how the hell they did it. You know, and how they did it was they just had crew members that, you know, they laid a little sh- short track. 
that crew members picking up the swing so that the camera could go underneath it. And then they would pick up the track as they were going over it and put it in front because they only had a little bit of track. So they're actually laying. It was like a Looney Tunes cartoon. They're laying the track as the thing was moving so that they could follow it up. And the idea, the whole idea was the lens that they're shooting with on 16 millimeter, the, the house would eventually loom to fill the entire screen like the monster. Yeah. Um, and so that's what they wanted to do with that sort of tracking shot. It's a remarkable shot that should not exist in this movie. And there it is. And it is also, it also is part of my Greek theory with this, that like the house is a big thing in Greek tragedy. The house of Atreus yeah. is, a, is this thing that runs through Greek tragedy. And actually the, the one that I did my senior thesis on uh, Thyestes, which is a Roman play, um, uh, the climax of the Thyestes is when Thyestes brother Atreus says, I, let's bury the hatchet. I don't want to be your enemy anymore. Let me serve you dinner. And he serves him a stew and the stew is made of, his, of Atreus's children. Right. Yeah. And he realizes as he's eating the stew and in some versions of the of the, of the thiestes you know like the stew tries to run away from his mouth <laughs> it's, it's very, <laughs> very steady very like maudlin you know but but uh but he eats it and, and and you know he realizes what he's been eating this is like uh, th i think there's a version of of this in a uh a movie i can't quite place where it turns out somebody has eaten somebody dear to, oh oh it's a boy and his dog right um, oh yeah uh but uh the LQ Jones, yeah, 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 but you're, but it's the viewer who realizes that, uh, it, not the, not the people doing the eating, um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, the house is like a gigantic symbol in these tragedies, right? It's like the house is becomes its own character. It, it, to be a member of this family is to inherit, right? And this is very political too. To be a member of this family is to inherit the curse that is upon this house, which can't be solved will never be solved. It comes from the gods. You can't do anything about it, right? Uh, you can just be part of it and not, you can either play your part in it or remain ignorant and still play your part in it. And, uh, uh, and we have both of those figures in the family, uh, in the house to you know, the grandparents, they don't, there's nothing left of them, right? But they're still part of it, right? They, they, uh, they're, they're, they're still doing their thing, you know, and you have Leatherface who's has a, a very utilitarian logic to him. He's not, you know, He's not uh, stupid, but he also is sort of very basic and he thinks about practical things, about how to get the work done, you know, and you have, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a atavistic, right? He's a, yeah. our, our primitive self. Um, other questions? Hey, Rick asked, uh, Toby Hooper said the film was about meat. What do you think the film has to say about our relationship with animals? So I'm the vegetarian here, I think. Uh, so, um, I mean, I think it is clear that there's a revulsion toward meat in this. And I mean, I think anybody, you know, I'm the kind of vegetarian who thinks when you learn what goes on in a slaughterhouse, um, you know, you're going to be repulsed, right? Now you can you can react to this the way that macho people do and they go, yeah, that's that's suffering, but it's delicious. And they, and they like to do that and stuff. But if you're a human being who, who takes his, or her feelings seriously you go yeah no I, I i wish to some extent i wish stuff like that didn't have to happen to feed me now you can still square that and eat meat it's it, it's not it's not like the only path through that is vegetarianism but um but it's unquestionably the case that we as people and this is beyond meat also that we as people have to do a lot of monstrous shit to make our societies work that's always going to be the case right it's just one of the unfortunate things about being human is that in order to make this stuff happen, some very unpleasant stuff has to go down. And when I say unpleasant, I don't just mean stuff that you later feel bad about. I mean, horrible suffering on vast scales seems to have been necessary for the entirety of human history for us to function the way that we function. It's just what we do, right? And at the most basic level, it's what we do to feed our bellies when we don't have to, right? I mean, it's, it's obvious to anybody who's over 16 is like, you don't need to eat meat. There's plenty of food to eat. If you found yourself in a state where it's just you in a lake and there's nothing else to eat, fish and eat the fish, you know, but otherwise it's, just, it's, it, it's egregious cruelty. And I think you can understand that and still be a meat eater. This is not a vegetarian point, right? It's like, you can understand that and still go, okay, yes, cruelty is necessary for me to survive. And that's how it is, right? And me, by me stopping eating meat, do I do any good in the world? No, just for myself. I make a moral decision for myself, but I don't save anything, you know? Um, so, you know, and I think on a, on, a broad, on, a, on a broader thing to take what you're saying is like, you know, the United States is founded on sanguinity. It is uh, founded on atrocity. It on, is built on, by the blood of people who got no stake in what they built at all. 
Exactly. Exactly. And we're still dealing with the uh, fallout from that morally, I think. And we, we always will. Anything built on, on having to eat others to survive is going to carry that either until the question gets solved or forever. And the answer is forever, you know? Yep. And, and that is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a work of enduring art uh, yeah. forever. It's our mythology. It's our Greek. It's our Orestia. It is a remarkable piece. And I'm so excited and pleased that you came here today to talk with us about it. Thank you on behalf of the Denver Public Library and everybody here. I want to respect your time and uh, give us a hard stop. Um, we if are... anybody ever wants to do the eight-hour TCM discussion, though, I I really never run out of stuff to say. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure that that's up to you and me. We're gonna do a <laughs> marathon again, like like we have in the past, and we're gonna we're gonna pro, we're gonna program it up. We're gonna do Hunter's Blood and Deliverance and Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. Oh, that's man. what we're gonna do. So cool. All right, um, and we're, we're we're gonna play out today with the song of John's choosing by a group called Jackal. Uh, 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 a band I had not heard of before yesterday. Thanks, <laughs> I'm so glad to introduce you to this music. Doing a song called Lumberjack that actually uses a chainsaw as an instrument. Which they did live, but I don't know if he had the chain attached. You know, he did. I read about this. He had the chain attached because he started ripping out the, the insulation yes. in the ceiling <laughs> as he was performing it. Imagine <laughs> that. You know, I, I saw Butthole Surfers once and he was shooting a shotgun, blanks I hope, over yeah. the audience at one point, the chainsaw would have been scarier. Yeah, Gibby was on acid for like a decade, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, he probably doesn't remember, but I do. I've never <laughs> been so frightened. Okay, um, John, thank you so much. It's so incredible to see oh, you. It's so good to see you. You Normally at this time, if it hadn't been for COVID, our paths would have crossed in the past year. So it's really good to see you. Well, I, I really miss you, and I love seeing how... how, how, how We'll be back out of the world. My son likes to say goodbye before. Yeah. Uh, so he to bye, say goodbye Roman. to everybody. Before. Can you say bye to everybody, bud? Bye. Yeah. Bye, Roman. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.